Um, can I start by asking, do, do we have any specialists in science education here? Really, that few? Well, that's not really surprising, is it? Because science education, as we all know, is pretty much perfect now. Um, <laughs> don't really need to be coming to conferences like this. Uh, there's nothing much left to learn. Uh, so uh, for the rest of you who aren't specialists in science, I've left the science there with the small s so it doesn't scare you. Um, we all know that ma many people do get scared by science, and, uh, and it's one of the things I hope to achieve today is if you are scared of science um, somehow, that you'll know why you're scared of science by the end of the next sort of 15 minutes or so. So... Um, about, well, it was August 2011, I found myself in the shadow of a young teenager, 18-year-old, called Jake Davis. And uh, Davis was, as Graham said, accused of hacking the websites of News International, uh, the Serious Organized Crime Agency, which shows balls. Um, he was uh, accused of hacking the Sun, and he also took down the website of the British Phonographic Institute, um, allegedly. And the reason why I spent the week in his shadow was because actually it was when he went into the city of Westminster Magistrates Court, he was clutching a copy of my book, Free Radicals, The Secret Anarchy of Science. And he didn't just clutch this book, actually. He waved it very provocatively at photographers, an act for which I am profoundly grateful and always will be. <laughs> Because uh, the, the press kind of went mad for it. And really, they are, were asking one question. They were saying, what on earth is a teenager doing with a book on science? Somehow, this kind of displaced the main story and became the kind of new world order that teenagers ought not to be interested in science. And so they wanted to know what, what was going on. So they looked into the book, and as the, the Daily Mail reported, this book... Uh, explores the idea that scientists of great renown often have an anti-authoritarian streak, a deeply anti-authoritarian streak, as the, the mail put it. And uh, shockingly, for something in the mail, that's absolutely true. <laughs> so scientists actually do uh, have a very strong anti-authoritarian streak. They also lie and cheat. Uh, they take part in experiments that have no ethical approval. Uh, they commit research fraud on a re very regular basis, um, and they get themselves involved in physical fights sometimes. And uh, I will give you some examples of these behaviors later. The question is, A, what really, the, the main question is, why didn't you know any of this? And this is kind of what the book lays out and, and seeks to explore. Why do we not know about this? And actually, to find the answer to this question, I had to go all the way back to 1946, at the end of the Second World War. And at the end of the Second World War, uh, Winston Churchill makes a very interesting statement. He says, the Stone Age may return on the gleaming wings of science. And a few years later, he said this, it's arguable whether the human race have been gainers by the march of science beyond the steam engine. Give me the horse. Now, that's actually quite a shocking statement because pre-war, Winston Churchill was made very um, pro-science statements. Uh, but there's a clue. And another quote, that comes in 1956, so the great geneticist Jacob Bronowski said this, people hate science. There's no use beating about the bush here. Now, in 2012, that's actually a very shocking thing to say because nobody hates science anymore. Science has, um, has made our lives in, you know, immeasurably better. It's been fantastic. It's been a huge success story. So what was going on? Well, actually, what happened was, at the end of the Second World War, people were terrified of science. Londoners, for instance, had faced the V2 rockets raining down on their streets. Um, of course, we'd seen the horrors of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, productions of scientists, a huge team of scientists. Um, prisoners were returning from Nazi concentration camps and Japanese prisoner of war camps and talking about horrors that uh, they'd experienced, atrocities committed on them by scientists. And of course, our own soldiers, the Allied soldiers, had uh, performed experiments on, had had experiments performed on them by scientists. And there was a general culture and an attitude that science was not really a good thing. And uh, the higher echelons of science, those kind of in charge of, of science across the globe, knew that they had an image problem. Now, it's a very um, difficult problem to solve immediately, but they did set about trying to do something about it. 
Bronowski said this. This is kind of what the first attitude was. The scientist has become the monk of our age, timid, thwarted, anxious to be asked to help. And science took on this, this sort of persona of being, we will help you, and we will make the world better, and you don't need to fear us anymore. And this was um, actually made very explicit in some ways. Um, when you go back and read memos that were exchanged between the Royal Society and the BBC in the 1950s and 60s, some of them are extraordinary. Um, so the Royal Society to the BBC, can we sometimes forget war and atomic weapons? And you can kind of guess what the BBC were focusing on in their coverage of science. Industrial advance of productivity, and say something more of the history and growth of science, of the great solution. Um, and uh, the evil wrought by science springs not from any intrinsic evil in science itself, but from its misuse by men who do not really understand what science is. And these memos, and there are others like it, and other uh, uh, attempts were made, were part of a huge PR effort uh, made by the kind of higher echelons of science, the scientific establishment, uh, to improve the image of science. And they effectively set up something that uh, I would say, um, I think I call it brand science. And brand science has these brand values. It's safe. It's trustworthy. It's a route to a better life. It's invaluable. It's dispassionate. I won't read them all. It's literal. It's bias-free, objective, rational. These are the, the values of science. And these are actually the values that we tend to associate with science now. Um, so in, in one respect, it was a very successful PR campaign. Um, unfortunately, it had a couple of unwanted side effects and unexpected side effects. And those you can see by actually, if you read this slightly differently and go from top to bottom on the left, what you find is that science is actually stayed dull and boring. And we're in a terrible position where we've suddenly realized that we've done something to science that it was never meant to be. Now, um, you can see this in a couple of ways. Uh, one of my favorites, let me read this to you. This is a paper written by Albert Einstein in 1936. Some time ago, R. W. Mandel paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation which I had made at his request. This note complies with his wish. Now, anyone who's a science teacher in this audience will know that's not how you write up scientific results. Um, and all of you who did science lessons at school will know that there is actually no I in science. You don't say I. You don't say I filled the test tube with acid. You say the test tube was filled with acid. And we're in the extraordinary position now where most of scientific papers that are written by a single person never have the word I in them. They always refer to themselves as we, as if you know, every scientist was the queen. And um, this is part of the dehumanization of science that has gone on. And part of this whole sort of project of brand science was to take away the chance that people might be scared of science or people might be scared of what scientists will do. And uh, scientists learn to kind of pull themselves out of it and to pull their humanity out of what they did. And there have been several consequences of that, which I, I haven't got time to go into. But one of them is, is interesting, um, a little puzzle for you here. Um, and this test is given to primary school students. And uh, they're asked to tell uh, whoever's doing the study which of these faces are scientists. And uh, overwhelmingly, they choose three faces out of these scientists, uh, out of these pictures, all of whom, whom, by the way, are scientists. So if you think you are failing, you're not failing. Um, the faces they choose out of these 10 faces are the faces that are not smiling. Because, they say, scientists don't smile. <laughs> oh, dear. So we've got ourselves into a situation where people think Right from very early on, and there are really interesting studies done on children about what a scientist actually looks like as well, but people think scientists don't smile. Scientists aren't fun. Now, let me tell you something. Scientists are fun. Let's run through a few examples. This crafty Galileo who scammed the Pope when he was uh, proving that the Earth goes around the sun. His proof actually didn't work, or his main proof that he thought was the best proof about the tides didn't work at all. And when people told him that it didn't work, he took no notice and published it anyway. And uh, basically knew he was committing a kind of fraud, but felt that it was worth it. Now, he got the result he wanted. Um, sneaky Albert Einstein, who took possession of the equation E equals mc squared, published eight attempts at proving it, and actually not one of them was without a fudge or a flaw. Um, and when this was pointed out to him, he said, I don't care. 
Um, there's the rebellion of Crick and Watson. Now, they were explicitly told by their bosses to stop working on the structure of DNA and, uh, and to uh, move on to other projects because it wasn't working. They also stole data from uh, Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, and uh, later James Watson referred to the burglary and apologized. Um, but this was what they needed to do to get ahead. And I hope you're starting to get a sense of actually scientists pretty much do whatever they need to do to get ahead. There are people like Barry Marshall who won a Nobel Prize for proving that bacteria cause stomach ulcers. In order to do this, he carried out an experiment uh, without ethical approval in that he drank a cupful of bacteria uh, and then uh, a few days later said he damn nearly died. But uh, he made it through and got his Nobel Prize and he proved the point. Um, and there are plenty of examples of self-experiment in science. And then there are the drug takers, um, which is surprisingly common in science, actually. There's been various studies done that show that uh, something like a fifth of current working scientists use some kind of uh, illegal substances or off-label prescriptions in order to help them in their work. Uh, Carrie Mullis here also won a Nobel Prize for chemistry. He is the person who uh, first discovered how to copy DNA. And he showed that you could uh, do this. Uh, thanks to his experiments with uh, LSD and other hallucinogens. So there are plenty of examples of people um, doing things that maybe we wouldn't normally associate with scientists. Now, it occurs to me that all of these people are fantastic. Oh, the, I've got another one here. Werner Forsman catheterized his own heart against express instructions, got into a fist fight with the radiologist who was trying to stop him taking the x-ray that he eventually fraudulently published as being a corpse's body. Anyway. I could go on and on. My point is that these are excellent role models for teenagers. And we have a problem with our teenagers. Up to age 10, children love science. They're fascinated by science. They're really passionate about science. And between the ages of 10 and 14, that drops off like, a like something dropping off a cliff. And part of the reason for that is that that, that age, these children, these students are learning to rebel. They're learning to kind of move outside of their comfort of their home. They're learning to hate their parents. I have an 11-year-old girl, so you know, I'm, I know where I'm coming from on this. They're learning to live without authority figures and to challenge authority figures and to do things and take risks. And actually, that's exactly what scientists do. And yet, of course, thanks to brand science, you're not allowed to tell students this is actually what science is all about. And it's this incredibly creative endeavor. The educationalist John Ogborn said, a central fact about science is that it's actually done by a very small fraction of the population. Um, the primary goal of a general science education cannot be to train this minority who will actually do science. Now, I would argue that telling people about the mavericks and the outlaws and the, the bad behavior of science actually gets people passionate and interested and engaged in science. And you don't necessarily need to teach everyone how to do everything. Um, one of the things, um, I'm a humble journalist, and I won't teach educators how to educate. Well, I'm not that humble. But um, <laughs> let me just say, I, I think a lot of the way that science is done at the moment, instead of teaching it like a creative discipline, it's kind of taught like motor mechanics. And uh, if we were to teach art in the same way, then perhaps we would talk about self-portraiture by saying, well, let's just take a 10 by 10 portion of this canvas and see what Van Gogh really did. And perhaps we could even create a tally chart of how many dots of each color exist in here. And if we all put it together, we should know how to do a self-portrait. Nobody would teach art like that. And uh, I don't think we should teach science like that either. So just to really come back to the teenager, we're raising a generation, I think, of, of students who really haven't got access to all that they should have. And we're effectively uh, making people teach science with one hand tied behind their back. Another interesting study that was done uh, showed that uh, the most highly socialized and extrovert children uh, drop science as soon as they are able. And those who go on to take science at higher and higher levels are uh, actually the introverts, the shy, the awkward uh, children. So in effect, we are raising a generation of timid scientists. Uh, we're raising a generation of shy, non-extrovert um, scientists. And I'm afraid that the next generation of scientists is going to have some serious work to do. And there's climate change, there's issues of drought, there's energy drought, there's issues of famine. You know, we're going to have to be feeding 10 billion people by the time these people are working as scientists. And I would argue that I would rather have in the scientific canon all the extroverts, the uh, mavericks, the go-getting, adventurous, bold, risk-taking students, and maybe even the drug-taking students 
as part of the scientific canon, as part of the scientific workforce. And I'm afraid at the moment that's not happening, largely because of this whitewashing of the history of science and the nature of scientific creativity that's been going on. So um, I would argue that really brand science has been screwing the future of our children. And uh, my plea would be, let's screw brand science. Thank you for listening. Thanks.